Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Amory Lovins. He's the co-founder and chairman emeritus of the Rocky Mountain Institute and adjunct professor in civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. Amory has authored 31 books and over 700 papers. He's advised 70 governments and he's been awarded 10 honorary doctorates over the past 45 years. Let's bring Amory Lovins into the conversation. So Amory, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thanks for having me. It's always a great, great pleasure to see you. Where are you calling from today? Uh, from my home office and indoor passive solar banana farm, 2,200 meters up in the Rockies near Aspen. And you can see, let's see, over on the very far left, just the remains of a banana crop we're harvesting at the moment, number 78, yellow, yellow. Uh, I don't know, we, banana phone doesn't always work right, but there's crop 79 and 80 behind that. And there's no heating system. It's cheaper to build that way. So you designed and built this property uh, and it's in the mountains. I'm just going to sort of, because you went really fast, you always do. And I'm going to slow everything down a little bit for our audience so they can keep up. Um, and, and so you, you're at 2,200 meters. So how many feet is that? That's like nine. 7,100 7, 7, feet. And it used, okay. to go as, it used to go as low as minus 44 Celsius, minus 47 Fahrenheit. Right. And so you designed a home. It has no heating and you're growing bananas. Is that correct? Yeah. And a hundred other kinds of higher plants. And the reason it's cheaper to build that way is that you save more construction costs, not needing a heating system and all the kit that goes with it. Then you pay extra for the super insulation, super windows, ventilation, heat recovery that got rid of the heating system. Now, your history doing this stuff, I mean, you're, this is one, one, there's one interesting point there already, which is that you're a doer. You actually walked the walk. You didn't just write the paper, uh, which you did, <laughs> but you also built the house. And I want to go all the way yeah. back to, the, to hmm. the big paper that kind of got everybody's attention, which is the road, the road less traveled paper. Was it 1976? Is that, road would you consider that the beginning of, yeah. um, or the, what was it? No, it was that. I've got the uh, title there wrong. Uh, there, en energy I? strategy, the road not taken. Road not taken. Not yeah. the, I'm, I'm doing too much poetry, too little engineering here. So it's the road not taken. Um, and uh, was that? Would you consider that the beginning of the sort of um, the the your journey, or was that a, was that an important marker for you? Because it certainly was for me when I read it. Yeah, I think it was for a lot of people because it reframed the energy problem. I'd been getting into energy before that. My first professional paper on climate change, for example, was in 1968. Uh, but in um, in the foreign affairs paper in 76, uh, I showed that the classic way of thinking about what is the energy problem, namely, where do we find more energy, more of any kind from any source at any price, wasn't leading in a good direction. It would, it would be too expensive, too unpleasant, too slow, too difficult. But we should instead start at the other end of the problem with the end uses. What do we want the energy for? We want hot showers, cold beer, baked bread, smelted aluminum, mobility, comfort. And for each of those services, each end use, how much energy of what kind or quality of what size from what source would do the job in the cheapest way? This was rather a revolutionary idea. Uh, and there followed a year of intense debate and when the dust had settled, Dave Sterlight, who was chief economist of ARCO, kind of summed it up by saying, I, don't, I for one don't care if Lovins is only half right, that would be better performance than I've seen from the rest of them. And then the firms that had been most critical started hiring us to help them do what we described, which was basically efficiency and, and appropriate renewables and a transition path to deploy all that. But in those days, efficiency was viewed with great skepticism. Uh, a lot of people who should have known better said, if you try to save energy, we'll be back to caves and candles. It's quite amazing what they said, because they, they assume we and everybody else in the world uh, has a free market economy, and those are, uh, of course, perfect. 
So all efficiency worth doing has already been bought. And in those days, supply was in quite a primitive state. Some uh, rather odd people thought you might be able to make wind machines compete, but that was great with, with great skepticism. And although there was some solar power up on satellites, the notion we could cut the cost a thousandfold and use them on earth was just unmentionable. So when people said solar, they meant solar water heaters on your roof. Right. Now I associate that, I should point out by the way, that um, that paper in 1976, you wrote that when I was 13 and I, I was, I'm a geek, I'm a wonk, but I'm not that much of a wonk. I only really came to that much, much later because um, I studied energy, energy and I studied the sort of energy choices that you were um, uh, sort of setting out your stall against. So I studied uh, you know, mechanical engineering and I studied nuclear power and I know we're going to have to get back and cover that as well. So I did very conventional energy technologies. I actually went off and became a ski bum. Um, and, and so I didn't kind of get back to uh, energy until um, 2003, really, when I started to get back into it. And by that time, a lot of your thoughts had percolated through, but not they weren't yet the received wisdom. They were not yet. I mean, the, the, the other, the old energy system was still very much in the driving seat. Um, you know, there was a big debate about peak oil. That was about as intellectual as it got. And, um, but the idea that there was this, uh, these other things that one could do, and I discovered it then as I started to do my early research for new energy finance, I discovered your, uh, your seminal paper and thought, um, yeah, that sounds, that sounds pretty convincing. So you convinced me you, you played a big role in, uh, in starting new energy finance. Well, oh, good. Uh, it's it certainly turned out well for all of us. It's a wonderful thing you've done, uh, and uh, I, but I, I think now we're we're in another kind of revolution, uh, and it's not only on the supply side where most of the attention is. Uh, and take this house as an example. Uh, it's saving ninety nine percent of the space and water heating energy, about ninety percent of the electricity, half the water, all with a ten month payback with 1983 technologies, today's are much better and cheaper. And it applies practically anywhere. Soon after we moved in, an architecture professor from Bangkok showed up and said, well, I've got a hot, wet climate, not a cold, dry climate, but I'm about to build a house. And let's see if I can do what you did in optimizing the whole building as a system for multiple benefits uh, from single expenditures, like this arch you can see above my head has 12 functions, but only one cost. So he went back and did that. I later visited him. He was saving 90% of his air conditioning energy. Uh, normal construction costs, better comfort. Well, uh, just about everybody in the world lives in a climate between his and mine. Now, buildings use three fourths of US electricity. Uh, most of the oil, of course, goes to transport. So out in the driveway, I've got a, uh, carbon fiber electric automobile, my first hypercar concept we came up with in 91. Uh, and it's about four times normal efficiency, 124 miles per gallon equivalent, uh, 53 kilometers per liter. And you could do the maths. Uh, but uh, 1.9 or on the German test, 1.7 liters per 100 kilometers but at a very competitive cost, which surprised everybody because carbon fiber is so expensive. It was thought to be just for handmade race cars. Well, it turns out if you make the car out of carbon fiber, you also save two thirds of the investment in water and half the energy space and time needed to put the car together. And it needs a lot fewer batteries because it's hauling less weight because the carbon fiber is light. So we, we paid for the carbon fiber or BMW did in this case, that we we had claimed this in the 90s and they validated it. You, you pay for the carbon fiber by needing fewer batteries, a smaller propulsion system all around, uh, and it's easier and cheaper to make. So another example of what we call integrative design, whole system design, and it turns out to apply in every sector, practically every application. I teach this stuff at Stanford and we're just drowning in great examples examples from all over the economy and all over the world.
And just to clarify, when you say the uh, the BMW, is that the BMW i3, which is the first yes. car to have a carbon fiber frame and, uh, and, and in, in in volume production, they've sold volume production. Right. They've sold over two hundred thousand of them, uh, and it was it, it's very popular. Of course, they they'll discontinue it in Europe in twenty twenty three. It's got a good run, eleven years, because uh, they need the production space to make other stuff that's right. now more more l- lucrative. I like it for a lot of other reasons, including half normal turn radius. So it's very agile, like a little cutting horse, very good in the city. At this point, I probably shouldn't admit that I'm still driving a uh, 4.4 litre petrol SUV with the turning circle of a London bus. Uh, And the reason I do that is because uh, it's seven seats and I have to go up and down very steep, very icy um, tracks. And there is no seven seater EV as yet, but I'd I, I, you're already. I can see your 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 mind going there. You're thinking about how no, you can. I think you get a seven seat uh, Tesla actually. You you can, but you know what? You can't put skis on the roof because it has gullwing doors. One of the stupidest design uh, decisions uh, ever, in my view. Well, no, that was a bit of interest. Yeah, I, I think a an S. Anyway. You can, you can look it <laughs> I, up. I can, say, I can see your mind going back. But but what I want to come back to though is this. You you call it inter, integrated design. And so, you know, if I sort of summarize, I could maybe paraphrase uh, my sense of where you're going with this is what you're doing is thinking deeply at the design stage uh, and maybe spending a little bit more on the costs of uh, production, although maybe not, because actually it becomes so light and so much, uh, so there's, you know, eliminating parts at the same time. Um, but you're definitely on a whole life basis saving an enormous amount yes. of resources and energy and water and space and all these other things. I mean, is that a, is that a, a fair ca- uh, characterization of what uh, yeah, you're talking about? Now? Yes, and if, if you do this across the whole economy, uh, really designing whole systems in uh, factories, equipment, buildings, vehicles, uh, you end up with several fold larger energy savings than practically anyone now thinks is available are available. Uh, and the cost goes down. I'll give you another example from industry because industry uses about half the world's energy and electricity. Uh, about half the world's electricity runs motors, half the motor power runs pumps and fans. Uh, out of the pumps come pipes, out of the fans come ducts, and people don't tend to pay quite as much attention to those. Well, it turns out the friction in a pipe, for example, goes down as nearly the fifth power of its diameter, but the cost goes up as only about the second power of diameter. So you can use fatter pipes and then the pump of the motor get much smaller. How much? Oh, about 80 or 90% smaller. Get a factor of five or 10 shrinkage on all that expensive equipment. And uh, in fact, in our house, just we, we saved 97% of the pumping energy by properly laying out some pipes so that they're fat, short, and straight rather than skinny, long, and crooked. Well, if everyone in the world did that to their pipes and ducts, you would save about a fifth of the world's electricity or half the coal-fired electricity, and you'd get your money back instantly in new build or in under a year, typically, in retrofits in buildings and industry. Uh, And yet this is not in any standard engineering textbook, not in any course I know of except mine at Stanford. Uh, And it's certainly not in any industry forecast, government study or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology, it's a bloody design method. Most people don't yet think of design as a scaling vector, a way to make things big fast. my mission is, is uh, to spread this round and mobilize an army of practitioners, tradespeople, teachers, and students uh, to try to make integrative design the standard practice, because that will make the supply investments uh, a great deal smaller, cheaper, and faster. Yeah, so I'm smiling. As you were talking about the um, shorter, fatter, uh, bigger, uh, uh, straighter pipes, um, because in 1992, I did some work in the cheese industry in Germany, uh, in a factory that was, and you would have absolutely, you'd have, you'd have, you know, just uh, uh, shaken your head. Um, they were moving around a processed cheese. They were squeezing it through long, skinny pipes with right angles, 
and around the factory um, in order to sort of take it from where they were melting it and making it to where they were, you know, packaging in oh, machines. Lord. And uh, and I kid you not, when they pumped, the lights went dim. Well, Peter Rubsey was uh, retrofitting some uh, equipment at the Oakland Museum. He asked the pipe fitters to lay out the pipes as if they were drains because in another part of their brain, the pipe fitters know that if you put a right angle in a drain, which runs only on gravity, not pumping, it'll clog. So we need to bend minds, not pipes. And the, the key here is what in Asian philosophy is called beginner's mind, original mind, child mind. You need to put aside your assumptions and preconceptions. Forget what, what they taught you in trade school about laying out pipes that need right angles. So they, the pipes crossing the room are three to six times the friction they should have had. Uh, this is a good way to charge more because there's more labor and more parts, but it's not good for your customer who wants to save energy and investment uh, and can indeed cut the pumping energy and uh, well, about a factor of five or 10 and, and the investment similarly. And, and of course the savings cascade because, well, we know for example, International Energy Agency and others talk about mainly two things you do to motor systems to save about a fourth of their energy. Well, if you do 35 things to motor systems, uh, you save upwards of half the energy uh, and uh, you get your money back several times faster. But if you do the pipes and ducts friction reduction first, then the pumps and fans and their motors and electronics get five or 10 times smaller. So that's a good time to fix up the motor system and do all 35 things. And the reason that's a lot better deal uh, is that you only pay for seven of them. The other 28 are free byproducts if you do the right things in the right order. So then you end up with fat pipes, little tiny pumps and motors, looks like a decimal point error, but it's not. <laughs> uh, your total investment goes way down. And then you have money left to do other stuff. So I um, am working with uh, a bunch of plugs. When I say working with, I'm trying to amplify the messages coming out of a bunch of very, very good heating engineers. So there's a podcast called Beta Teach. And um, it's all about how you get uh, lower carbon heating systems in homes. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the, the refrain is always that the fitters and the engineers no longer have the skills to design. So for instance, in the UK at least, there's an absolute dearth of people who can do a heat loss calculation for a home. They're just <laughs> used to sticking a great big boiler on the wall, combi boiler, and then uh, and not setting it up correctly, setting it up so it doesn't even condense, and then on to the next job. And so I'm gonna to have to point them to this idea of um, shorter, fatter, straighter pipes. Uh, oh, but, um, but better if you design out the pipes though, by putting a tea cozy around the house, uh, like the Dutch uh, energy sprung uh, ex exterior retrofit of what's what you call outsolation as opposed to insulation. And actually in the UK, it's been demonstrated they can super insulate your house to net zero standard in a single day whilst you're off at work. And meanwhile, they've dropped in a very efficient uh, heat pump core for mechanicals uh, and put on a super insulated solar roof. And when you get back, you pay them uh, rather than your energy companies. And uh, they're already about at the point of industrializing this and scaling it where uh, you can get to net zero uh, without subsidy that is paid for by the energy savings over the years. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just, you know, in certain homes, I mean, there is a lot of, there's a lot of homes where it's very difficult to, because they actually turn up, they actually come up with a, I don't know if it's 3D printed, but a complete uh, sort of facade and kind of stick it onto the outside of the home. Yeah, it's fabric, um, factory fabricated and it's typically yeah. made of insulated panels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, when it, when it works, I think it works really great. But um, one of the, the question that I would have about the integrative design is, um, I mean, you came up with this, you started on this route in 1976, but it's not universal yet. And that's 45, 47 years later. In fact, it's so very rare. I guess my worry is you've got a process where you kind of have to get the design right up front. I mean, we, you, you talk about renovations via Energiesprung, but by, by the time they're doing a renovation, it's already much, much harder. So you've got 47 years and we're still not 
building this approach in at the beginning of product design, home design, car design, you know, uh, factory design and so on. So, I mean, I could throw this all back at you and go, well, okay, so Emery, what's going wrong? If it's so obvious and you think it is, and I'm a big disciple, right? Why is it not happening? Well, there are 60 or 80 obstacles to buying energy efficiency, including completely perverse incentives, like we pay our architects and engineers for what they spend, not what they save. Uh, many utilities get rewarded for selling more energy, not cutting your bill. Uh, people buying cars have such a high discount rate uh, that they only pay attention to the first year or two of fuel savings. So it, whether you get an efficient car is as unimportant as whether you, it has floor mats and so on. Now, each of these 60 or 80 obstacles can be turned into a business opportunity, but the systems involved are quite complex. Like in commercial properties, there are about two dozen parties, each with perfectly perverse incentives, all speaking different languages, using different metrics, not talking to each other. Uh, and uh, if you leave out one, that can be a showstopper. So that actually scaling the implementation in a complex system like that requires relentless patience, meticulous attention to detail. And there aren't enough of us doing it yet. We've had some great successes, uh, but it's a big world. Now, of course, this is most important in countries like China and India that are building so much of their infrastructure. And as you say, it's much easier to build it right than fix it later. Uh, and some of those have centralized institutions that can change the rules. Uh, and centralized methods of education, uh, like the IIT system in India, uh, that, that can spread the word very quickly. Or you could have, you could imagine an outfit like EESL in India that did such a brilliant job spreading LED lights everywhere and cutting the cost dramatically. You can imagine them uh, perhaps getting design spread out and not just technologies. But we have a lot of work to do. To be fair, I didn't think of integrative design in 76. That came later. But yes, we've had a few decades at it. Uh, and I'm hoping now that I've, I've got a uh, perch at Stanford to be able to put those lectures out on the likes of edX or YouTube to be free to the world by the millions. Uh, and uh, also to do scaling, for example, teaching wonderful Stanford students every year is not a scaling model, it's linear. But if I could teach the teachers and get many of the best design teachers in the world to share our experience, uh, I think that might start to be a scaling model. So I was um, a commissioner. The IEA had a commission on the urgent, um, it was called the IEA High Level Commission on Urgent Energy Efficiency. And what we were trying to do was to increase the average rate of energy efficiency improvement, which has been about 1.6% per year, to get that to 3%. And there was the 3% club where people were going to, countries were committing to get to 3%. Well, the most recent results were that the 1.6% has now dropped to half a percent in the last- No, 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 no. no, no. We've got no, it's the, now, you know, the COVID and the bounce it's, back. It's, still. It's, it's now back to 1.9, which is the past decade's average, but we do need to double it or more. Well, we'll put in the show notes a link to the IEA's most recent, um, like yesterday, uh, announcement of its energy efficiency report, where the figure was, was definitely not 0.5. Now, maybe that- That's the, maybe that's that's the previous year. Maybe it's the previous, yeah, it's entirely yeah. possible. Because I think yeah, it's, it's of just about to act. It was half a percent in 2000. It's back to 1.9%. Oh, that's right. That, in that's 21. Exactly right. Now, but what's interesting, of course, where we don't need to disagree at all, it's not 3%, and it's not yeah. 4 or 5 or 6%, which it would need to be if you really want to get to, mm -hmm. you know, if it really uh, is going to uh, do the heavy lifting that's required of energy efficiency for net zero. Um, and we produced, this was 2019, we produced a perfectly wonderful report with case studies. It was the highest level group of people that I've ever been on. It was great fun because going around the room, it was kind of minister of this, minister of that, minister of the other, and Michael Lee Bright. Um, And we essentially, I don't want to say we bounced off the issue, but I'm, I don't think you could say that this was a 
you know, historic moment where, you know, where, where we finally got serious about energy efficiency. It just seems to be a really intractable problem. Mm. Yeah, I actually wanted to talk to that group about integrative design, but uh, it didn't happen. Uh, you, sh you should have pinged me an email, and, and we could have we could have uh, you know helped to make that happen. Yeah. Um, I guess I I don't know the answer. I'm not fishing for an answer. I'm just trying to get you know the the, the benefit of your you know you because you are a, a huge optimist and a and a um, you you, nope. um, you well I don't know you you're very you're, you come across as enormously optimistic. You're very positive and you're very you know convinced of the, the benefits of this. And you the the like, chapter you know, it, it will save you money, not cost money, and yet it's not happening. Uh, it is happening, just not fast enough. But the, right. the chap in the upper photo here, uh, Dave Brower greatest conservationists of the 20th century. My, one of my mentors said that uh, uh, optimism and pessimism are different sides of uh, a simplistic surrender to fatalism where you, you treat the future as fate, not choice, and don't take responsibility for creating the future you want. So I live instead in a spirit I call applied hope, which is not mere glandular optimism. It's right. choosing and doing things each day that create a world worth being hopeful about. Because hope is a stance, not an assessment, as Frankie Le Pay yeah. said. And Paul Romer <laughs> talks about um, passive and active optimism. Um, yes. So it's the optimism of, a, of, a, of a, a child waiting for a good Christmas present is passive, but a child who looks at a tree and says, I can build an amazing tree house, that's your applied hope, right? Yes. Or active optimism. Yeah. And I, I agree with that entirely. I guess I, you know, I'm just looking for, um, you know, tips because I do get asked the question often. You know, how do we, you know, how do we accelerate on energy efficiency? And you know, you talked about this myth that people think, you know, some people think energy efficiency means going back to the caves. There are also people who think that energy efficiency is pointless because of this wonderful thing called the Jevons paradox. Oh Lord. Where Whatever you do, you then go and spend that saving on more energy sucking, energy demanding uh, appliances or holidays or whatever. Or if you understand what you just did, you spend it on more efficiency. Uh, this, there are about five layers of, of rebound is the generic term for what you're describing. Uh, and it is a real effect. It's a small effect, except in the most rare pathological cases, it's a few percent effect. So yes, we counted in our analysis, but it doesn't significantly change the outcome. Uh, and there are a lot of simple ways to fix it if it were a problem, which it's not. Uh, it's, it's only a conceptual uh, trap that some economist rediscovers every decade or so and thinks it, it's uh, <clears throat> everybody missed it. No, it, it's a very well-known effect. And uh, by the way, the only level on which it's real uh, and significant is that energy efficiency is a significant macroeconomic stimulant uh, on the other hand, that doesn't mean you should blame uh, the invention of steam engines and efficient motors for economic growth if you're an anti-growther, which many such critics are. Uh, <clears throat> rather, uh, you could make exactly the same case about emancipation of women, public health, education, and other things we've done that, that change the shape of the economy change how society works. And I don't see why we should single out energy efficiency as a culprit uh, in producing growth that some people don't want. So one thing we can do is because we do have show notes that go with this, uh, this talk. Um, if there is a single fantastic um, article or source, either by, by yourself or by somebody who, who can uh, verify that, that it's a few percent effect and it's not more than that, I would love it because I tend to get uh, people bringing up the Jevons effect, who people who are sort of anti-renewables, anti-energy efficiency, they're very much on the supply side. Generally, frankly, um, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're promoting nuclear power because it seems kind of unlimited. And mm -hmm. therefore, uh, you don't try these other things. You go for my secret uh, silver bullet is, is how I see the Jevons paradox being played in the debate. So if you can help to kill the Jevons paradox, that'd be very helpful. I'll, I'll send you a few things. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, I, the nuclear thing is, is such a distraction. You know, in 2020, the world added 0.4 gigawatts more uh, nuclear capacity than it retired, whilst the world added 278 gigawatts of renewables. That's a 782-fold greater capacity 
And if you correct for capacity factors by technology, US average 2020, then it's about 230 some times more annual production capability. And by the way, this year it's shaping up even stronger. We'll probably end up with about minus three gigawatts of, of nuclear additions and plus IEA says 290 gigawatts of renewable additions, um, game over. Right, so um, you, if we go back to your, you know, we, what we've spoken about so far today has been the energy efficiency, the absolute value of, you know, proper design, integrative design reduces the demand for the same energy services, the same utility in life. Um, but then you've, you switched, I perceive it as being switching to the supply side, you wrote this book called Reinventing Fire, which was all about the supply, the renewable no, no, solar. No. It's the not renewable. all that... about supply, it integrates the two. That's, ah, okay. that's the okay. important bit. So it showed how to triple efficiency and quintuple renewables in the US. And that would get you to 2050 at historically reasonable pace, okay. uh, needing no oil, no coal, no nuclear, a lot less gas, saving $5 trillion and running a 2.6 fold bigger economy with 80, Two to eighty-six percent less carbon. Okay, and now, uh, but with so, so I was sort of mischaracterizing. I was saying switching to the, the the supply side, but you've now you know rounded out the picture, integrated the supply side, um, and the one area. I mean, you know, there is one area where you and I tend to disagree, and it is around nuclear, where I'm um, very comfortable running the existing nuclear um, as long as it is safe. Um, and my, uh, you know, my, my read of it is that there's plenty of safe nuclear power stations producing a lot of low carbon, cheap at the variable uh, level nuclear power. Um, and there's this enormous push originating largely out of Germany, but not only to shut down even existing nuclear power stations and to, in a sense, forbid work on either a new generation or the next generation. Um, and you know, when you come up with statistics like how unsuccessful nuclear has been at building new capacity, there are those that would say, well, that's because, how can I put it? That's because the green movement has been so successful in demonizing this technology, you kind of make it impossible to build and then say, ha, you see, you can't even build. And so the debate is, very fraught, and it is one where I think you and I don't share the same position. Oh, that's that's healthy. Uh, but as a student of this <clears throat> technology since 1963, I, I do indeed have a different view, and I, I think it, there's very strong evidence for it. The, the notion that it's the greenies that stop this is uh, frankly utter rubbish because exactly the same nuclear decline is observable with minor differences of detail in countries with uh, utterly uh, impotent uh, regulators with public participation ineffectual or even legally prohibited. It's all around the world. Uh, and I think the, the basic uh, uh, force behind the decline of nuclear power is that it has no business case. I take China as an example, uh, because it's responsible for most of the current and planned nuclear growth in the world. Uh, well, China in 2020 invested as much more or less in renewables as it had invested the previous 12 years combined in nuclear. Uh, the renewables outgenerate. Uh, out outgenerated, actually just sun and wind outgenerated nuclear by a factor two. They added six times more output. They added uh, 60 times more capacity in 2020. Why? Because they cost two or three times less according to some outfit called Bl Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, <clears throat> so again, even in the ca case where nuclear is cheapest, renewables are cheaper still and efficiency cheaper than that. So, and by the way, there is no new type or size or fuel cycle of reactor that will change this. Uh, just, you know, do the maths, indulge me for a moment. Uh, I think it's generally agreed among serious students of the subject that new small modular reactors or advanced reactors of whatever type will 
send out electricity at twice or more the cost of existing ones, which they hope then to reduce that, that difference by mass production. The existing ones, according to Bloomberg, are about five to 13 times dearer per kilowatt hour than renewables uh, uh, unsubsidized. And then those renewables also, according to BNEF, will get another factor two cheaper by the time you could scale uh, SMRs. Uh, well, two times, uh, like five to 13 times two is a factor, you know, up of, of several tens. Uh, and you're not going to uh, bridge that gap of cost by mass production. In fact, even if the reactors were free, they couldn't compete because the non-nuclear kit, which in today's reactors is 78 to 87% of the prohibitive capex is still too much. Uh, so it's the small modular renewables, the other SMRs that are decades ahead in exploiting their formidable economies of production scale and nuclear can't catch up. The problem is then that when, uh, when uh, legislators become convinced that they should sub subsidize even more the operation of the existing reactors because they are, as you say, an existing source not burning fuel, uh, they are compounding the capital misallocation uh, that makes climate change worse. Why? Because the low operating cost you referred to averages three cents a kilowatt hour in the United States and generally more in the rest of the world. I've reviewed that in detail a couple of years ago. Uh, it's more than efficiency by a factor typically two, three, often more. It's more than modern renewables. So if you buy, if you continue to operate the existing nuclear plants, even though they're carbon free in operation, you're not saving as much carbon as if you bought cheaper per kilowatt hour carbon free resources to replace them and that's it's not as as bad a making climate change worse as if you were to buy new reactors which are very far out of the money by an order of magnitude but but it, it's still uh not saving as much carbon as per, per dollar or per year as you could if you bought the most climate effective options first. And that's what we need to do. This, this mushy mantra of all of the above, a substitute for thought and choice, is particularly inappropriate if you're worried about climate. Because the worse climate change is, the more we need to invest judiciously, not indiscriminately, to buy the most climate effective options, those that save the most carbon per dollar and per year. Nuclear is not that. Uh, <clears throat> You know, if, if you hear some official, as one recently did say, uh, oh, we're in favor of all of the above, we're not uh, picking and backing winners. Peter Bradford, the Dean of US Utility Regulation, retorted quite properly, no, you're not, we're, we're not picking and choosing winners, they don't need it, we're picking and choosing losers. Well, I, 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 um, I don't want to, I had a guest on this show, who was very into, uh, very much involved with the all of the above strategy back in the day uh, under uh, President Obama, but I'm not going to name his name because it would be unfair. But I know who you're uh, thinking of. Um, but it would, but he would deserve it. <laughs> now, but but let me let me just push on this a little bit more. So, uh, because I I sort of fundamentally disagree with this idea that there's a limited amount of money. I mean, there's four hundred trillion dollars out there in the world of capital formation. And um, we can walk and dry our fingernails at the same time or walk and chew gum at the same time. I mean, we, are, we do have enough cash, so there's nothing to stop us running existing nuclear power stations and also investing in wind and solar, which, you know, they have. And by the way, you know, batteries where we have supply uh, constraints anyway at the moment. And, you know, when you look at these um, electricity systems where they shut down nuclear and you see the fossil fuel use, you know, soaring in the subsequent years. That may come down afterwards, uh, but that's not the point. It's absolutely clear that prematurely shutting down nuclear drives up the uh, the, uh, the the fossil fuel use. It drives. I, 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 with great respect, Michael, I think we must be living on different data planets. 
Look, I, I know well, for example, the Japanese and the German statistics, which show exactly the opposite of what you've just described. Germany has pulled off the wonderful tr trick of uh, phasing out nuclear. They'll be done with that next year. They agreed it 20 years ago. Uh, and dramatically reducing uh, fossil fuel and carbon at the same time in Japan. Yeah. Anyway, we are slightly on a different data planet there because I look at the UK versus Germany, sorry to interrupt. And you know, the UK, which has kept its nuclear and uh, you know, implemented a lot of wind has dramatically outperformed Germany in reducing uh, carbon emissions. Germany for many years was absolutely flat as it shut down its nuclear, its electricity um, carbon intensity remained almost completely flat. But that, years. but that is no now, longer the, the case. You have years, to, started, not not since 2013. You've got to look no, at no, the but, more recent data. But take take uh, the view from 2005, 2000, yeah, 2000, 2005. And by the way, wait and add to your data when Germany shuts another three nuclear power stations on uh, at the end of this year and see what happens next year, whether they use more or less fossil fuel, because well, it's pretty clear what they're going to do. Well, in Germany, 2010 to 20, the lignite power generation went down 37 uh, percent. The hard coal by much more than that, uh, oil by 52 percent, gas went up 3 percent. But yeah. uh, there's a very dramatic reduction in both kinds of coal yeah. burning in the past few years. And, and in, that, imports, that reverse, imports of nuclear electricity from France? The net exports went up in that period, yeah. Yeah. Uh, slightly. Uh, and, you don't need to be very careful. And, and, and ac ac actually, ac because... actually don't, don't confuse yeah. physical flows of electricity with contractual flows of right. electricity. But, but also, but also what you'll see, you, you know, you have to be careful where you get the data from because a lot of German energy analysts, fans of the energy vendor will say, oh yes, but you know those net exports, that was what all the coal, all the coal that we were using was export and our use was very clean. But of course that doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And what they were, what they were doing was burning a lot of coal and gas still. More than in the UK, where you know the UK by keeping its nuclear um, went from forty percent in two thousand twelve, forty percent coal to a couple of percent uh, where it is now. Um, I, th so I, th I think the I think the German uh, experience is just as dramatic. And as for the Japanese example, uh, they lost for a time all of their nuclear output, yeah. uh, and now they've got last I looked nine units running. Uh, they've, they have uh, 20 something that are viewed, that they declare as operable that haven't run for 14 or yeah. 12 to 15 years and will probably never run again and have no business case to run. And yet the, the fossil fuel generation over that past decade uh, barely budged. It, it went up maybe 10 or 12 terawatt hours uh, no. Or maybe it went down, depending on which month of revision you look at. Uh, because as in Germany, both the nuclear and the fossil decreases were offset by a combination of savings and renewables. And that's especially impressive in Japan, where they have policy that looks pro-renewable, but is very ingeniously anti-renewable, especially wind, which is almost completely suppressed. A question for you. Would you... If you look at um, the next generations of nuclear, whether it's small modular, whether it's fusion, whatever it is, would you, what would be your research budget for those? Would you spend absolutely nothing or would you say, well, look, you know, it's a big world. There is a lot of money around and it makes sense to have some small percentage to have a portfolio of strategies and we should be spending something because, hey, there can be a breakthrough. Maybe fusion, maybe, I, would it be zero or would it, or, 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 or not? I don't know. It depends on the merit of the proposals. It would certainly be small because I don't think either fission or fusion in any known configuration has a ghost of a chance of having a business case. Huh. Uh, but, you know, I think the issue, Michael, is not whether there's enough money in the world that we can afford to spend it on foolish things as well as intelligent things. Uh, I think it's that if we have a climate emergency, we need to focus intently on deploying 
the most carbon displacement on supply and demand sides that we can per dollar and per year. Uh, and this is, this is a, a terribly conservative and sound idea of marginal cost effectiveness, or in this case, climate effectiveness, that I don't think you would disagree with in principle, but you are proposing um, to disagree with it in practice. No, I, I, I don't know whether it's in principle or in practice. What I don't like, I don't like central planning. I don't like central no. planning. Of course, if you're going to have a research budget, then there is an element of central planning, not in the sense of picking winner companies, but winning, winning, you know, you do have to sort of say, right, the bulk of the money will go on this, but maybe we have some side bets. And so that's kind of how I see it. Well, paying uh, half or more or probably all as we end up of the cost uh, of next generation reactors with conscripted capital doesn't lead to a good place. And the numbers are rather simple. Right now, the world is investing about $0.3 trillion a year in saving energy and $0.3 trillion a year in modern renewables. Uh, at the same time, the world is investing about uh, 0.03 or 0.015, depending on which numbers you like, trillion dollars a year in nuclear. The investors have fled. They voted with their feet. And what we now see is a massive move to socialize nuclear costs because it's a very politically powerful industry, uh, not because it's climate effective. No. But let me let me come down to there was another thing that I think you um, have worked a lot on and it's related it's moving on from nuclear but it's obviously closely related, which is the intermittency, I mean, you know, wind and solar. Um, the sun doesn't always shine you'll have noticed that even through marvelous design of your house. Uh, We've had 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud here. Right. And, and so how do you uh, ensure resilience. Um, of the energy system, if it is based, you know, if you're just constantly buying the lowest sort of levelized cost, um, and by the way, there's also a 0.3 missing in the statistics you've just given, because there's also 0.3 of a trillion, in fact, a bit more than that, spent every year on the grid, on upgrading the grid, and mm -hmm. some proportion of that is also driven recently by these, you know, sort of ballooning proportions of renewables, which require grid investment alongside the generating capacity. So what's your formula for keeping the lights on and keeping it affordable and keeping the users paying for it? Well, first of all, I would get the terms right and intermittence is actually not properly applied to photovoltaics and wind. They are highly variable in output, but their variability is very predictable actually often more predictable than energy demand. It's predictable enough that the East Danish wind operators uh, can bid wind power into next day's hourly auction, having more confidence they can deliver to contract on time than the grid operators have, that when they push the button, their peak will, peaker will actually start. Uh, <clears throat> the term intermittence is, I think, properly applied to forced outages that are unpredictable. And that, that's very characteristic of thermal plants. They're down about seven to 13% of the time, but typically in larger chunks and for longer uh, than for portfolios of renewables. Therefore, it turns out in places that, that actually break out the costs like the ERCOT, uh, the Texas market, the cost to, of grid integration is typically higher often by several fold for say uh, wind farms than it is for say gas fired power plants or coal fired. You, uh, I, excuse me, I, no, I, I, said, I said it the other way around. You said it the other I, way around, yes. I, I, said, I said it wrong. It's higher for the big thermal plants because they tend to fail less predictably and bigger yeah. and longer than for the renewable portfolio. So the grid integration is actually cheaper uh, for the variable renewables. But that's because you diversify them in space and in time. You operate them intelligently. They tend to be complementary seasonally and often diurnally as well. Uh, and there are also uh, dispatchable renewables, which are <clears throat> quite substantial 
So that's big and small hydro, not to mention pump storage, where there's a lot of that installed already. Uh, geothermal, burning municipal, industrial, and agricultural wastes, burning obsolete energy studies, that's my favorite. Uh, and of course, we also have distributed storage, which will become quickly quite enormous in electric vehicles that are parked 95 odd percent of the time uh, and are starting to get bi-directional. And you can store heat much heat and cool much cheaper than storing electricity. And then, of course, there's the demand side. Uh, efficiency uh, has an important effect on timing as well, because it makes things happen slower in uh, the temperature of buildings. And there was just a new NREL study beautifully showing over an order of magnitude reduction in investment if you compete building efficiency, retrofit efficiency against both supply and storage, and then you don't need most of that seasonal storage hydrogen people talk about. Uh, and then, of course, there's demand response itself, which in Texas we found was about three times bigger than had been thought. So you add all this up, and there, there are altogether 10 carbon-free ways to keep the grid reliable, resilient, uh, uh, and affordable as it gets renewable. Right, but and all, only one of those is batteries. They, they happen to be the dearest at the moment, so we shouldn't assume this is all about batteries. No, it's definitely not about batteries, but I guess I worry about because there's a lot of sort of um, there's 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 a, a lot of sort of places to you know it's like the Neapolitan Cup game where you kind of you know where did the where did the problem go because you know we've got in Europe um, we have wind lulls that last two or three weeks you have. In India, you've got the monsoon, where I'm assuming the solar out for a number of weeks is you know, dramatically reduced. Uh, even in California, it does rain. I remember the Queen went to California and it rained, and people, you know, in the UK, they, they thought this was just extraordinary, and it, and it was, uh, hence I remember it, 30 years or whatever it is later. And, you know, when you talk about demand response, it tends to be you know, a few hours. Batteries globally, the amount of batteries are a few minutes even the batteries in vehicles, they, they would run the global economy for maybe once you've got lots of electric vehicles, it'll be a few hours. And you've got a few hours here and a few minutes there and maybe a day if you add in thermal storage and you really work it hard and so on. But you know, we've got a system that is becoming more and more electrified. We're removing coal, we're removing gas, we're removing um, nuclear, we're removing things that have got storage that's kind of inherent in them. And you know all those pipelines are going to be gone, and we are becoming dependent on weather. And every so often, there's a few weeks where the weather just doesn't deliver. And I don't think well, that the things you name I, add up to enough. To be honest, uh, I, what what you're raising, and, and rightly so, is an issue of seasonality, and the dark dark well, doldrums. It's the, not the just seasonality. Is. Because I mean, seasonality would suggest that it's very predictable. I'm talking about, you know, you can have no, two no. weeks without and, and, wind and, in the summer or yes. in the winter. In and, and, and I was saying things like the Dunkelflaute in Germany, yeah. the dark doldrums. Yeah. Well, there's a very interesting new uh, study just out from uh, Elia, the, the Belgian-German consortium. The German part, by the way, uh, is 50 Hertz, the former East German utility, one of the most reliable on the planet. Uh, I think you'd have to go back to probably before World War II for their last big power failure. Right. Uh, and uh, so these systems are 99.999% reliable. And by the way, 50 Hertz is 62% renewable last year, heading for 120, 32. So they're not novices at this. So they've done a very nice analysis for Europe because it is the poster child of these wind lulls and, and long cloudy winter periods. And they found that on a pan-European basis, once you build the east-west interconnectors that didn't get built because of the Cold War until now, you know, then you find that, according to them, and I, I think their data are correct, uh, it hardly you hardly ever get more than four days uh, yeah. of of wind and sun together falling below twenty percent of of normal, uh, and they found that. To cope with this, and they looked at a period of some years, uh, 
you would need green molecules for backup, hydrogen, ammonia, whatever, made renewably, amounting to about 6% of normal winter generation. And you only need one or two weeks of that backup, not months as has often been claimed. So I, I, you do need to look at the weather statistics and we also need to look ahead to make sure we've got this right uh, at uh, whether there are basic changes in global weather patterns that we need to okay. be more worried about. But you know, even if you, if you felt you had to deal with this by maintaining in retrievable mothball the existing uh, gas-fired capacity and, and gas in reservoirs, that, that stuff already exists. And in fact, the capacity you'd need is, is about the right size to fill the European need in 2050. Uh, no, but it would, so much better. Run. Feel, it would so run I, rarely, rarely and yeah. briefly. Yeah. No, I, I feel like I, I said it was a bit like the Neapolitan cut and ball. I mean, and I, think, I feel like I found it because, you know, I, I believe we do need the green molecules or even very, very infrequently used brown molecules, peakers. Well, we need something because we can't get um, the normal electrification plus heating electrified, plus transport electrified, plus industry electrified, and then have any risk whatsoever of even four days where... Yeah. You know, even having, four days once every five years, that's four days when a lot of people are going to, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, die. It's, it, this is that serious, uh, the resilience challenge. Well, having written the basic book on resilience for the Pentagon in 81, I, I'm, I take very seriously the yeah. responsibility you describe. Of course, the, the big uh, uh, question here as we electrify everything is whether global use of electricity will go up or down. And I think it could go either way. There are many studies assuming two to six fold increase in global electricity needs in 2050. Uh, there are of course inherent and very strong efficiency gains as you electrify many uses. Uh, and there are also other ways to save besides energy saving, my, one of my favorites is that, you know, half the weight of a typical mid or high rise building is the floor slabs plus more to hold up that weight. But you can save three quarters of that, that cement and steel, which together cause 15% of CO2 emissions by proper structural design. You can use a corrugated five centimeter thick slab instead of a, a flat 30 right. centimeter thick slab, and it's cheaper. Uh, then you can fit three stories in the vertical height of two with the same ceiling height. Why would you do anything else? Uh, so what we don't know is what really happens uh, to electric demand if we do integrative design, if we compete efficiency against supply, which hardly anybody bothers to do, uh, and a whole list of other things, right. some of which we've mentioned. And, and this, this um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very struck by this point about not competing efficiency against supply because in reinventing fire, we worked out that the US could quadruple electric end use efficiency by 2050. And the cost of doing that would average a 10th what we pay for retail electricity today. So we didn't buy nearly enough efficiency. Hmm. And that was even not considering most of the integrative design. How much more efficiency would we buy if it were fully fairly competed against supply, even the cheap renewable supply, probably a great deal more than most people suppose. I mean, we're out of time. We've actually gone one hour. I would love to hear your thoughts on, there's all sorts of things we could still talk about. Um, I would love to hear uh, explicit thoughts on primary energy. Um, when we think about primary energy, what sort of, what sort of, uh, um, problems does that, what, sort of, what, what blind alleys does that lead us down? I would love to hear your thoughts on um, heavy industry, on heavy trucks, all sorts of things. Um, but I, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, but I, leave us with a, with a final thought. You know, you've got this, this um, sort of modest but extremely influential audience out there. Um, what would be the, the single message you want to leave them with? Well, I hope I live to see a world where all ways to save or supply energy are 
fully and fairly competed at honest prices, regardless of their type, technology, size, location, or ownership. That's pretty much the opposite of the system we have now in most of the world. Uh, and uh, we also need to look at the entire energy system because right now we've got grid centric people saying we'll need a lot of extra solar and wind to cope with extreme conditions. We've got people wanting to decarbonize the other four fifths of the economy not yet electrified saying we're going to need to build a whole bunch of sun and wind to make green molecules to run our industries. Well, actually they're often, as Tony Siba points out, talking about exactly the same solar and wind used for different purposes at different times, but being double counted. So we need to get out of our grid silo and look at the whole system. And I think we're going to find that an efficient, renewable, resilient energy future costs a good deal less than business as usual and as the Oxford INET folks say, the faster you do it, the cheaper it gets. So these uh, academic, and I would say even scholastic disputes about what should be your discount rate and how does that affect what you do about climate are completely misplaced. They're looking at trade-offs that don't actually exist. Uh, and we just need to uh, move quite aggressively on efficiency and renewables and not worry too much about exactly how we'll get from 90 to 100% renewable. We know we have enough ways to do it that are adequate and cost effective and attractive. We don't need to know now exactly which ones we'll use. As Ken Caldera said, we shouldn't let uncertainty about the end game unduly influence our opening moves. So I'm, I'm glad you finished there with Ken Caldera, who's a great hero of mine. I shall gloss over the reference to Tony Sieber, the Tony Sieber who thinks that uh, that 95% of vehicle miles driven in 2030 will be in autonomous electric cars, a vehicle which does not exist today. Uh, I have to say, not somebody I have a lot of time for, but your <coughs> desire for uh, an energy system that, uh, that allows competition of energy efficiency and thermal storage and other goods uh, on equal footing with, um, with, with uh, some hard supply. Um, let's just hope that amongst my many listeners, uh, that Father Christmas is one of them. We have Christmas approaching and hopefully that uh, request will be heard and will be granted to you. I suspect you've got um, decades to go in your career, uh, but I very much hope that that uh, vision of the future arrives more quickly uh, than you think. Emery, it's been a huge pleasure having you on Cleaning Indeed. Up. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. You have a good day. My pleasure. And uh, remember the bananas. We'll never forget the bananas, the banana phone. Thanks, Amory. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that was my great friend, Amory Lovins, co-founder and chairman emeritus of the Rocky Mountain Institute and adjunct professor in civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. My guest next week is Peter Sweetman. He's the founder and CEO of Climate Strategy and Partners, a world expert in energy efficiency and climate investment. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Peter Sweetman. Thank you.